Thank you for joining us on Election Brief on the Joy News Channel on Multi TV. My name is Jifa Bampo. Now, there are still incidences of electoral corruption, such as vote buying, as political parties and their functionaries campaign for the December elections. This is the verdict contained in the Ghana Integrity, uh, Integrity Initiative's latest report on reducing abuse of incumbency and electoral corruption in Ghana's election 2016. Let's get details from Raymond Aqua, who joins us in the studio. All right, so Raymond, what's the scope of the report? So this is actually a survey that was done between July and August this year. The most important part is that they did monitor 20 different constituencies. So they sent people out there to monitor the activities. Two groupings they used. First and foremost, the history of the constituency. And so they selected the first six using the history. Then the other 14, also looking at how keen and competitive the elections will be in these particular areas. And that's how they got the areas they selected for the survey. And in talking about um, these um, issues of uh, vote buying, did the GI give specific examples? Yes, they actually cited specifically that on Sunday, 17th of July, in Japa, after an NDC rally, the Parliamentary candidate there, Dr. Francis Dakura, was actually seen not only distributing 10 motorbikes, but he was also captured on camera distributing two Ghana cities uh, to the, what they call a crowd there. So whoever he gets to meet, he's holding the money in that particular picture, giving them as he goes along. There's another incident they mentioned, though, and this has to do with the provision of medicine and other pharmaceutical equipment to some communities to secure votes. And they say that on Wednesday, July 27, 2016, the First Lady donated medical equipment and supplies to N Navrongo War Me Memorial Hospital. And this was part of a child transmission HIV AIDS program. But the program was also used to canvass for votes by the various parliamentary candidates. And she added a voice to that particular canvass. So that was medical equipment used to secure votes from people from that particular community, they suggest. These examples you gave all seem to filter around the parliamentary. You also talk about the first lady uh, uh, included as well. What about the president? Okay, so the president is cited that on August 16. The president joined his uh, publicly announced four-day campaign to the Western region, actually distributed outboard motors and pants uh, to fishermen in second day. Indeed, the president spokesperson uh, on the Super Money Show admitted that the distributions were part of an ongoing government intervention, but proceeded to say that the coalition, I mean, this were purchased with state funds. The coalition considers this as an incident which connects with a political party activity because right there and then, for the venue, they did a rally. The president also outlined good things they had done for farmers and other things. They could not separate the two activities. So this is one case of abuse of incumbency. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond Aqua, for bringing us uh, those details from the Ghana Integrity uh, Initiative's latest report. But let's speak to the executive uh, director of the uh, GII, Linda Ofori Kwafu, joins us. Good afternoon to you, Mrs. Ofori Kwafu. Good afternoon, Jifa. Thanks for speaking to us. So is the GII surprised at all about the results from this latest report? I, I must say we are not surprised. Um, these happenings take place during election period, and it actually happens a lot. And so we are not surprised. In 2004, there was a media monitoring. In 2012, we did the same. In 2016, uh, we are also monitoring again together with other partners, the CDD, GACC, and CIMAC. And so we are not surprised at the findings. There's only the experience of uh, vote buying and vote selling that is a bit worrying and we have to speak more about that. So is this more of uh, vote buying as compared to elections in 2012 or even previous elections? We are... the. the we are monitoring in some selected constituencies, and we are also doing a nationwide monitoring. That's an aspect many people do not know. We actually follow um, candidates, political parties, and we have trained observers who actually take pictures and give us recordings, and so we can validate all the things that we put out in our report. In 2012, we recorded very serious kinds of vote buying where satellite dishes were being given out, where school buildings were being, being painted at, la at last minute um, before the elections, roads were being constructed and all that. In this particular period, I must say people are engaging in the act, but I think the 
because they are where citizens and society organizations would be monitoring. They, they, they are not doing it so openly as it, as it happened in the past. So, so this is so it's now more of a covert operation as opposed to an overt one these days. Yes, it, 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 both ways. I, I'm sure those who have never been affected by abuse of incumbency, monitoring and size or vote buying, are uh, still doing it openly. But those who have experienced that last year where they were named into an extent thing, and that actually affected them one way or the other, are very careful the way and manner they go about engaging in vote buying or abusing incumbency. I must right. also say that we realize that... Um, MPs or certain MPs are not abusing incumbency so much. The ones we captured had to do with the presidency itself, but not necessarily any MP that we know of engaging in acts that can be described as abuse of incumbency. All right. Um, we did indicate that uh, this would be party functionaries. We didn't specifically mention MPs. However, I've heard of vote buying, abuse of incumbency, but your report on page six mentions something that seems new to me, vote selling. What's that, and what's the difference? The vote selling is, selling is actually, actually a variant of vote buying. It's actually happening now, and we say it's worrying because when citizens start making such demands from politicians and ask them to provide them before the election, it has two things. And it's actually happened in Ho, it's happened in so many other places where they hold placards and demand from political parties, especially the incumbents, because they know they hold the state resources and demand from them to provide certain kind of social amenities before they will go to the polls on December 7th. And it's worrying because you are actually telling politicians to look for money. It doesn't matter where you get it from because we know you do it all the time. So now we have also become very intelligent, sophisticated, and we are demanding from you because they call it the cocoa season. So provide now. And that has serious budgetary implications. Where would they get the money from to provide? And also the threat that if you don't provide, you will not vote. is also something serious that at the end of the day, if you don't take care, the number of Ghanaian voters who are qualified to vote, I'm sure the easy figures can show if we don't take care, that is to go down and will not get the, uh, the, the numbers that we need to participate in the elections. And that should be very worrying for our democracy. So it we are concerned about where they will get the money from to fund because I know the politician needs the vote. So if mm -hmm. you don't take care, they will provide. And if they provide... Where are they getting the money from? So at the end of January, you see us all going back to INS and begging for funds. Briefly, uh, Mrs. Ofori Kwafo, is it possible really to ever eliminate incumbency advantage or vote buying or even vote selling in a developing country such as ours where the needs are so, um, you know, intense? It is possible to reduce it. You realize we are not using the word elimination of vote buying, incumbency advantage or whatever. We are seeking to have a conversation going forward and actually having a policy to deal with this subject. Both buying itself is, 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 is a crime. That one is not good and we have to stop that one. But both, both selling and also incumbency advantage abuse is something we have to get a policy to reduce. Now we don't have anything. So the every incumbent government finds itself uh, uh, doing this anytime it's, it's an election year. And I, I'm sure as we have a conversation around it, if you go down, we can get a policy to regulate it going forward. But there's something I must say, Jifa, before we go off. Uh, um, the Ghanaian, every Ghanaian, I'm actually, I think most citizens have become very conscious. And I will give this to the credit to the work that we have done in the past. People are now aware of vote buying. People call the office and give us pictures. People are very interested in the work that we are doing because there's something wrong with it. So I want to actually encourage Ghanaians to continue doing that, discuss the subject, condemn it, and actually the politicians also deserve because we are getting so many pictures and so many uh, information, recordings from them. Just that it takes time for us to validate. We are not able to put all out there. But when the next report comes, I'm sure we can capture more issues and present it to the public. Many thanks to you, uh, Mrs. Linda Forekwafo. She's the executive director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative. Now, one of the constituencies where votes will be keenly contested for by the governing NDC and the opposition NPP is the Ayawaso West Wogon constituency, specifically votes at the University of Ghana. Now, yesterday, two presidential candidates were on the campus to interact with students 
First was the CPP's Ivor Green Street in the afternoon, but it was President John Mahama's visit later in the evening that garnered a lot of attention on the campus. Now, knowing the state of youth and graduate unemployment, which has taken center stage in this year's election campaign, President Mahama indicated his plan is to create the environment to enable the private sector create jobs. Cannot absorb the number of people who are coming out of our educational institutions. And let me tell you, the whole of the public sector, that is those on government payroll, paid by the controller and accountant general, is 600,000. 600,000, that's all. Everybody who is paid by government on the controller and accountant general's payroll is 600,000. That's teachers, doctors, nurses, watchmen, cleaners, electricians, everybody, 600,000 soldiers, policemen, everybody. Now, from our universities and our tertiary institutions, we are producing nearly 50,000 graduates a year. Take that and look at the size of the public sector. Definitely the public sector cannot absorb 50,000 people a year. So it means that they will be absorbed mostly by the private sector, by the financial institutions, the telecom companies, the oil and gas companies, the uh, tourism companies, and all the other private sector groups. So government's first responsibility in job creation is to create a stable economic environment so that the private sector can grow. That's one. Then government's second responsibility is to make sure that our young people are coming out with the right skills for the world of work. Increasingly, our country has continued to change. And so, our country is demanding a new set of skills. And so, we need to guide our young people to look at the job market when choosing what course to do in any institution. Because there are some areas where there's a saturation. There's a saturation, we've overproduced. And so, if you do that same course where there's a saturation, your possibility of getting a job is slimmer than if you move in an area where the job market is demanding more and more skills. And so, we must guide our young people to go more into courses where they are employable immediately they come out of school. And we must also create opportunities for jobs to exist. And that is why we are investing in socioeconomic infrastructure. President John Mahama there. So what did the students whom he was seeking to make a case to think of his proposals and ideas? He did well. He was able to analyze the circumstances that we face as a country and he brought out the measures we will take to solve the problems. I, I know. I know he has a lot of things to do for us. So it's just a matter of giving him the second chance. And then I believe in him. Yes, I believe he can give us jobs. So I'm not worried at all. I just believe he can provide. It is excellent, really. It, it is really excellent. You see the schools, especially my road, this thing region, the road leading to Akutia, God, it's excellent. Seriously, I'm for JM. That is why I am choosing JM. It's a comprehensive speech that he gave. He tried to, he covered every sector of the economy. He covered every sector of the developmental agenda that he's trying to push. I think where the, the places that facilitate me most is the is there was the name the infrastructure development um, um, low stratfall and you know it he made it clear he made it clear. that's the only thing i wanted to hear and that's the reason why i came here because many people are talking about the um the teeth and the job aspects sharp 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 and the job aspect you see he told us it's not every course that i should do some are overwrapped so you have to take your time know what you want to do in future if there's a job vacancy then go in then offer your course and talk about more about more entrepreneurship to the job vacancy i learned i learned from his speeches that uh, the the uh, the students allowance that the trainee allowance was scrapped off for a purpose yeah. it was not really yeah. scrapped yeah. Up, but it yeah. was yeah. replaced yeah. for yeah. a 
the thoughts of some students at the University of Ghana yesterday. And still with the campaign, a lot of us know that for election 2016, three main issues are taking center stage. The economy, job creation, and infrastructure. And now it's a battle over who is right on the health of the economy in relation to the country's credit ratings. Before September this year, ratings agency Moody's had given Ghana a B- rating, suggesting a poor credit uh, rating situation influencing higher interest rates on the bond market. But at the beginning of October, Moody's reviewed the negative rating to stable, suggesting some improvement in Ghana's credit worthiness based on improved fiscal discipline and public debt management. Somehow, this has become a subject of debate between uh, NPP vice presidential running mate and President John Mahama. And it's been a back and forth over the health of the economy. Here's Dr. Baumia speaking at the NPP's manifesto launch. Economic mismanagement and corruption has resulted in Ghana turning to the IMF for a bailout. Fellow Ghanaians, Ghana's sovereign credit rating has been downgraded from B plus positive. Without oil, Ghana was being rated as B plus positive under the NPP. We've now come down with oil under the NDC and John Mahama to B minus with a stable outlook in 2016. So we've gone from B plus to B minus with oil. In fact, international credit ratings agencies like Moody's, Fitch, Standard & Poor's now have basically the same credit rating for Ghana. The recent revision of Ghana's outlook from B minus negative to B minus stable, that is the equivalent of B3 that Moody's has. With the outlook was revised from negative to stable has resulted in a misinterpretation by this NDC government and President Mahama that Ghana's credit rating has been upgraded. This is in fact not the case. Moody's did not upgrade Ghana. Ghana's rating under Moody's is still B minus. It is only the outlook that has been revised and that is not equivalent to a change in ratings or a, change, a, a ratings upgrade. The outlook is not equivalent to an upgrade in the ratings. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, but the president is not convinced about uh, his position on the Moody's assessment. It is the same with the economy. If you create the impression that the economy is in crisis, Ghana is going back despite all the scientific basis, even from outside. Moody's comes and upgrades us and says there's more confidence in Ghana's economy. We've gone from negative to stable. And then somebody who calls himself an economist can stand and say there was no Moody's upgrade. I can't think far, I can't think far. Well, I guess uh, you'll have to make that assessment yourself uh, as well. And it's still election brief here on the Joy News channel on Multi TV. Now, let's still stay with the uh, issues relating to the elections, but let's go to another political party, and that's the Progressive People's Party. They're still on a media offensive, accusing the Electoral Commission of discriminating against some parties. They addressed the news conference today, and the policy advisor of the party, Kofi Asamoasian, uh, says the commission could have equally disqualified other parties who'd breach some requirements the commission set out in the nomination forms and also in violation of the laws of the country. Mr. Samoa gives an example of the NPP presidential candidate, Nana Kufuado. We wish to put on record that the receipt the EC gave the PPP on 10th October 2016 was fraught with mistakes, major mistakes. Could you imagine that the amount the EC quoted in words is different from what was quoted in figures? Did you know that the EC gave us the, the receipt for the payment or the receipt that it gave us had this 1,700 Ghana cities in figures? 
end in words, they wrote 1 million 700. I don't know what that means. Apart from this, on the same receipt, the EC wrote, being payment of parliamentary candidate, parliamentary emphasis on parliamentary candidate filing fee. As if payment was made for only one parliamentary candidate. Clearly, we have every reason to believe that the EC had set itself on a course for a possible fraudulent act and we have therefore written to the Auditor General and the Economic and Organized Crime Office to investigate this matter and prosecute the perpetrators if deemed necessary. Does this not mean that it is possible for everyone to make administrative errors? If this is true, why does the EC want to work together with political parties with iron fist? Why is the EC adamant on its position and is not ready to open up for discussion? The EC gave us nomination forms to complete. It is intriguing the EC wants to be seen as an institution incapable of mistakes and committing errors. Yet, they are not immune from administrative errors, and I've just cited one above. We decided to be silent about this issue, but we have been pushed to the world to disclose what happened to our nomination forms. We wish to state that there was no page 46, and that district is a Krapun North district and one other district, in the nomination forms we received from the EC. However, we in the PPP did did not take them to task that the nomination form was illegal and, and doesn't qualify to be received. We called the EC to notify them and they proposed an antidote to this error. If the PPP had engaged in the elect had engaged the Electoral Commission to correct this blunder, why can't the EC reciprocate as demanded by Reg Reg Regulation 9? of CI-94. Our current EC commissioners are vindictive to say the least. This was an unfair treatment and the EC cannot tell us that this was also not a simple mistake. Kofi Asamoah is a PPP's policy advisor. Well, the party for now is not yet clear about when it will be going to court on its disqualification of their presidential candidate, Dr. Papa Kwesi Ndum. But in another development, the Electoral Commission has justified the disqualification of former First Lady Nana Konedwa Ajiman Rawlings, whose lawyers had challenged the basis of her disqualification as well by the Commission. Now, Joy News' Favor Nuno has been studying uh, the lawyer's letter and has come through with this report. Lawyers for the Electoral Commission have mounted a strong defense in an 11-page response after lawyers for the NDP flag bearer Nana Kunedu challenged their basis for disqualifying the former First Lady. According to the EC, contrary to the position of NDP lawyers that the Commission had no power to proceed in the manner they did by disqualifying their clients, the EC lawyers have argued that as per the Public Elections Regulation 2016 CI-94, Regulations 9-1, provide that a candidate shall be considered to stand nominated unless proof is given to the satisfaction of the retaining officer of the candidate's death, withdrawal or disqualification, adding that the rule affords the retaining officer shall give the candidate an opportunity to make amendments or any alterations necessary within the stipulated nomination period. However, this they say is conditional, constituting a correlative right enjoyed only within the stipulated nomination period. Failure to make alterations within the stipulated nomination period will render a candidate's nomination invalid. Plus, the CI-94 made no provisions for an extension. According to lawyers of the EC, in a specific case of the the NDP. They presented their nomination papers a day to the expiry of the nomination period. Although all candidates were urged to submit their nomination papers as early as possible, the commission thus was unable to accept Mrs. Rawlins's nomination as a number of subscribers to her forms did not meet the requirements of Regulation 2B of CI 94. 
And that's how we end the program today. Thank you very much for joining us on Election Brief. Hope you enjoyed it. If you missed the live broadcast, you can catch the show on YouTube. Thanks for watching. I'm Jifa Bampo. Thank you.